And we're back live from Amsterdam at the Volks Hotel. We're here at the ThingsCon 2017. Um, all afternoon with live video interviews with people that were, have been on stage the last two days, like Johanna Nissen Poem. You had a, you gave a talk as well. Yes. So what was it about? Well, it was about a new concept that I'm developing, and that is called Think Center Speculations. That's. Please do elaborate on that. Yeah. <laughs> so I work at the TU Delft in the Connected Everyday Lab with Elisa Giacardi, and there we use Think Center design as a method. And recently I've been thinking about uh, the relationship of that to my previous work or my current work as a designer. And I work a lot with speculative design and with design fiction. And, and I think what I do is to use a think perspective. Um, so looking at the world from the eyes of the thing uh, to bring you questions to see, to show a new perspective on the world and especially to the center, the human. Okay, but usually this is some people that say uh, design should be human centric because it's all about human. But you say it's the thing uh, centric. <laughs> so basically everything yeah. is about the thing and not about the human or the user, but the thing is the most important thing. So it's the contrary. Um, we, we look from the perspective of the thing, but to find new trajectories, new temporalities of our houses, of other things, but also people. So I think the, the big potential of this kind of met method is to uh, the center us as a provocation. Right. A provocation to think what would be our role and what we want to be our role. Yeah, so we've got a world of senses and sometimes there's a human being uh, uh, that is uh, passing by. And, uh, and that's important yeah. and we have to take it into account. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, so, so you've got so many different kind of senses and, uh, and things. Uh, uh, so where do you start? So how is my kind of process? Yeah, okay, because uh, um, if you say it's, it's a thing-centered design, I mean, the thing, there's so many things. Uh, yeah, um, so, so uh, we have a series of methods to do observations. So we consider things co-ethnographers. So we um, use their help to look at practices and situations. And then we have methods to um, translate these observations into insights that could be inspiring for a design process afterwards. Because you can't ask a thing. Well, we have some methods of interviewing things. Okay. So you could interview a thing. Yeah. So how do you do that? <laughs> uh, it's an interesting method um, uh, developed by one master student, great work, and uh, he, um, what he did is give, he gave actors, professional actors, a series of um, data collections from a scooter and then he asked them questions and they have to pretend to be the thing. Right, so you had actors playing a thing. Yes, exactly. Yes. So, and what, what kind of unexpected insights did you get from that? Oh, you can get um, really nice insights. Um, I don't know, for example, he found that scooters are used in different situations according to this, their speed and uh, you you can s become a bit more empathize, so you can empathize with the thing actually and, and know how it would look from, from that perspective. And I think in, in, in this talk I tried to develop this idea that you could do thing ethnography, you could look from the perspective of a thing also into the future. So you. You could do that with speculative scenarios, with fictional scenarios of the future. So we did in a workshop um, a similar experiment, but imagining a kitchen where people print their food. And you could see that from the plate, and the plate was moving and kind of connecting all these different steps that would be necessary. Okay. So it really helps you to to see something that you do every day in a very unfamiliar way, and that's always good for a creative process. Right. So now you have these new new insights and new perspectives on uh, on both reality and and, and future, maybe. Uh, um, so how do you take these perspectives to in, into new product services and everything? Uh, um, well, for example, I'm developing a tool that could help designers to bring all these insights they collected from either sensors or interviews uh, into a creative process. So using data as inspiration rather than as evidence of something you already knew, that this is very common in, in design nowadays. 
so I think it could be could be definitely an inspiration. Right. So this is another subject that is quite important here these these days. It's about uh, um, well. Uh, Ethics by design, security by design, privacy by design, etc. So, so how do you apply ethics to a thing? Uh, did, was there like an ethical kind of uh, um, framework for the thing? Um, so the way I work with that is um, to provoke people to think uh, how they would like things to be in the future. Um, what would be the conditions of so the terms and conditions of the things they want to adopt? And I do that many times by presenting a, a dystopia, so something they wouldn't like that makes you reflect on what you would like to do or to have at home. And um, yeah, I think this is this is one way uh, to to provoke to provoke people to think by themselves what would be sure. the the ethical values that they want to. So, uh, what kind of a dystopian uh, uh, scenario did you play? Oh, um, for example, things doing experiments with us. <laughs> so I thought that was really scary um, about Internet of Things, that many of the issues we have today online are coming home, and this means surveillance, this means um, systems, companies experimenting with us, manipulating the information that they show, um, discriminating by groups. Uh, so all these issues, when you put them into tangible objects that people can see and relate to and use, um, suddenly they become really provocative. Yeah, well, basically a good idea. I just come up with an idea now. I mean, if you if you can control the the home, then you would turn up the heat, and then people would uh, drink more beer. So that would be a good. Exactly. Uh, yeah. 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 Exactly. So I was thinking it's very different. Uh, this idea of experiments, because it's not only collecting data, but it's manipulating people. For example, if your coffee machine would give you um, a bit more coffee or less coffee every day and see how that impacts into your working practices. I would be very mad at my coffee machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. So we'd have a big row. But surprisingly, this is what many companies do online with the um, services, and we accept in the terms and conditions that they would do research with with users, and right. so we accept to that, and I'm thinking how that would look like in the future home with real objects. So do you have things in your own home? Um, I have many things. Actually, recently we are thinking about the definition of things as objects, people, and a situated use. So it's kind of expanded to, not only to the internet, things as having all these connections and being situated so yeah, I would answer yes, but I don't have any, or I don't think I have many connected products at home. Okay, but because um, I was curious whether you, after you started this process, whether you had a different relationship with these things. So did you did you, did you perceive Definitely, them differently? Yes, yes, of course. I had to quit some social media. Okay. <laughs> because I was more aware. I read terms terms and conditions of many services. Uh, so yeah, definitely changed. But did you also get like a different relationship with the physical thing in your house? Did you? I think I had that already because I'm, my background is in industrial design, and then I studied new media, um, so I always liked this. Or I always had this sensitivity with things. I love things. I love physical objects, and I, and and that's how I was um, attracted to the Internet of Things because I thought it could be. Um, interactions could be embedded into physical, everyday objects. Right. So now you've done this research, uh, um, what is going to be your next step? Is it going to be, uh, do you continue in this field or are you thinking of a new kind of project? Well, I hope to continue uh, doing research. I like to teach. I'm looking for teaching opportunities and also recruit, recruiting people interested in, in a particular project that is about um, objects hiding from us, objects hiding from other objects. So when surveillance comes home, uh, we will need to develop strategies. And especially I found this connection with randomness. So if objects would be unique, they would become invisible to object recognition and machines. And I want to explore that more. All right. So instead of uh, just having an object uh, under your couch, hiding from the security cam, it would be a unique object that yes, is not yes. seen as uh, that object. Maybe you should yeah. have like a, a unique yeah. covers for uh, for things so that you... Yeah, yeah, so I think it could go to many directions and I want to explore that. 
And I think, in a way, it's poetical, this idea that objects become unique again, yeah. because, you know... But then again, are... I mean, can we really fool uh, 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 the security camp? Because we, as human it's beings, we, we, we think we are unique, but still, yeah, uh, uh, still, we get singled out. So that's the challenge, and I think it's a good one, because it will help us to understand better these algorithms. In some cases, even developers don't understand these algorithms that they make. Um, so I think it's a, it's a conversation to have right. with machines. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much. I, I hope you. you're here next year with uh, hidden objects uh, or hiding objects. Uh, uh, it will be very nice, very interesting. Um, so thanks. Thank you, Thank you for watching. Um, we're live at ThingsCon uh, Amsterdam 2017, and we will be here this whole afternoon, so stay tuned. <laughs>